Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very important panel on an issue uh, important for the Sustainable Development Goals, important for climate change, but not often discussed. Uh, I'm welcoming this morning five very impressive experts on the topic of water. Uh, we have Paul Joy Jensen, Jensen, excuse me, uh, Elizabeth Watuti. Uh, who is the CEO, I should introduce who they are, the group president of uh, Grundfos and CEO, uh, founder of the Green Generation Initiative, Elizabeth Watuti, Prime Minister Mark Rutte, uh, Senior Minister Tharman of Singapore, and James Quincy, the chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company. So uh, what I find fascinating about this topic is I, when I think about water, I remember that iconic photograph from 1972 of the blue marble that we look down at the world and it is 71% water. And yet only 1% of that is fresh water. And while today we don't have an actual shortage, it's not in the right places for the right people. And, and, and there are 4 billion people who for at least a month of, of the year don't have access to clean water. And yet, as we think about climate transition, it is critical not just for food, for agriculture, uh, for drinking, but also for the minerals that we need to, to support climate change. And so this morning, we're going to use this opportunity to explore the many dimensions of how water is used and take this opportunity to help our friend, Prime Minister Hutte, as he prepares for the UN Conference on Water, which is happening for the first time in 44 years, which he is co-hosting as we think about some of the recommendations and opportunities that we have to, uh, to preserve and conserve and uh, distribute water going forward. So I wanted to start with you, uh, Senior Minister Tharman, because you have been working on an initiative to really look at the full <coughs> economics of water. And I was ho hoping you could share with us this morning some of the frameworks that you've developed to think about this issue in a broader context. Well, I think, uh, Karen, first you've summarized this, the problem very well. Um, it's remarkable. Um, most of us living in parts of the world where we've gotten used to getting a bit of water when we need it, just don't realize that such a large part of humanity doesn't have access to safe drinking water. Um, half of humanity doesn't have access to safe sanitation. I think the first thing we have to recognize is that water is going to be the first casualty, already is the first casualty, of the climate crisis. It's intrinsic and it's intertwined with the climate crisis as a casualty, but also as part of the solution. Because what's happening now is that climate, water, food, and energy are becoming more and more insecure at the same time. And they're feeding into each other. If we keep over extracting water, if we keep polluting water, it affects the wetlands, it affects the natural carbon sinks, it makes it even more difficult to address the climate crisis. So we're in a vicious cycle now. We're in a vicious cycle and it means we have to address each of these problems of the global commons together. The Dutch government has initiated a, a major new review, global review, an independent review um, of this water crisis and the solutions required. Uh, we're launching it later today, my co chairs and I. Uh, but Fundamentally, it now requires us to realize that it's not just what happens in the Sahel or some part of the world which is already in severe water stress, but it's a hydrological cycle that affects everyone in the world. That's why it's part of the global commons, not just an issue crying out for attention because a large part of humanity is affected, but because it's a global issue. What happens in one part of the world ends up in another part of the world that's intrinsic to the climate crisis, and water is intertwined with that climate crisis. Thank you. Uh, James, as, a, as the chairman of Coca-Cola, you have often discussed that water, just as, as Senior Minister Tharman did, is integral to the climate crisis and can't be separated. And you've launched a number of initiatives that, that look at water as part of that system. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've been, uh, you've been doing? Sure. 
Um, well, I think self-evidently when you're in the beverage business, uh, water is not just uh, an overall issue for the society, it's intrinsic to the business we're in. Um, you know, and, and so when we look at uh, ESG and our role, and, and very simply, we always think, you know, you can't have a successful business if you don't have a successful society. And so we have to think about our impacts on society, whether that's water or, or, or waste with plastics, the carbon footprint there, uh, or our impact on generating jobs and, and several other things. And so we very early on focused on water because it's self-evident in our products. And we set out a, a goal to return all the water we use uh, in making our beverages to the, to the environment directly or through replenishment by 2020. Actually, we got there in 2015. So we've been returning all the water we use since 2015. We're now well over 100%. And we continue to do so. Um, but having reached that goal, we actually realized there is no global average. Returning it all globally doesn't necessarily solve everyone's problems. Because um, actually, in the end, water is a local issue as well as a global hydrological issue. So we've laid out our 2030 water security strategy to really focus in uh, on those areas in the world where we have operations where the water stress is particularly uh, acute and really get into can we help out in those areas. And they, of course, um, as the senior minister pointed out, tend to be in the more vulnerable parts of the world, more vulnerable societies, less income, uh, less infrastructure. So we're focused there. And, of course, once you start drilling down, you, you very quickly get to the to the point which actually 70% of water extraction uh, is used for small holding agriculture or agriculture in general. Uh, and actually, agriculture accounts for a big piece of climate change. So the two things come together uh, at the local farm level in these water stressed areas. So we've, we've done a lot of work and we have a lot of focus on how can we help smart agriculture take place? How can we help them extract far less water, generate actually as much or better uh, quantities of food, and we do, we're doing, for example, a big project uh, in Bangladesh. 33 million people are going to be uh, impacted, working with a whole series of other businesses and NGOs. So we're, we're going from a kind of a global water neutral to how can we really focus in on the high stress scarcity areas uh, and really focus in on, on, on agriculture uh, where the extraction is taking place and try and bring that together and solve water and climate uh, with uh, complementary programs. So, Paul, James is talking about the integration of those two. Your company uh, is right at the heart of the water challenge and trying to support that. Why do you think so few companies are now talking about, it, to, to date, talking about water and water scarcity? Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And, you know, I, I think it's fantastic that we have great attention now here at, at WEF and we can sit here as, as strong water champions. But, but I think in, in general, I think we, uh, we do not care enough about this uh, precious, precious resource. You know, it's, um, as the senior minister also said, and we all know, you know, there's, there's just a limited amount of, of water accessible for, for life and, and, and for the society. And, uh, but it is a vital part basically of any process, any product that we are, that we are producing, water is there and, it, and it's needed. Um, and maybe just an example, and, and there's many of them. Uh, not many people are, are thinking about how much water does it take to produce one liter of milk, for instance, right? I mean, you may think about how much does, does, does the cow add into emissions or, you know, what did it take to produce the carton? But one liter of milk takes 600 liters or more, 600 liters of water to produce. It's simply, simply amazing. So, you know, solving the, um, solving the, the, the climate challenge is not just about the, the emissions. It's also about solving, solving water. And it actually, it's not either or, it goes hand in hand. And I think that's super important to, uh, to realize as also highlighted by, uh, by, by James. But I think actually we, we forget to add it into our strategies. We forget to add it into the total end to end of our supply chain in, uh, in, in, in our thinking. Uh, in that. And that I think we need to do something about and maybe just another, maybe a little bit scary, scary example, but, but it goes hand in hand, you know, around electrical vehicles and, and batteries. You know, it takes two million liters of water to produce one kilo of lithium, right? It, it, it is absolutely uh, insane. So, you know, and then sometimes, you know, or actually the um, way it produces is in a water scarce area, 
like in Peru or a place in China. It's just water scarce. So, so that is that is super super damaging. So you know, I think the uh, the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree goal or, or target that we that we all set uh, together, I think it's something that we can now all relate to, and and I think it it means uh, it means a lot to to all of us. It has made us all aware of what it is, and we're actually building scale uh, based on, uh, on, on that. And, and honestly, we have a common language on climate, but we don't have that on water. And that's, that's in my view, that is exactly uh, what we need to have in order to progress towards uh, a common goal. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Elizabeth. You are uh, here in two purposes, really. One as the founder of the Green Generation Initiative, and the other as the next generation. Uh, we used to describe, there's an American expression which is so inappropriate. We used to say, at the coal face, which means you're right at the edge of the problem. It feels like for climate change and water, that's not really the analogy we want to use. But you are inheriting the problems that we have created. And I would love to hear from you your advice to us, what you're, what you're seeing, first of all, on the impact of water, and your advice to us on how to, to start to think uh, more specifically about those impacts. Thank you. When I hear about the phrase, a fresh water future, it's the people whose daily lives are still so far away from this phrase that I think about every day. And I want to share with you very two recent and personal experiences that come in mind every other time so that we can have these experiences and these people in our hearts and in our minds even as we talk about this freshwater future. Because there's a big link between freshwater, nature, climate and the food crisis. Mm. And the first experience is the ongoing drought that is devastating countries across the Horn of Africa. And right now, almost 3 million people in my country, Kenya, and over 20 million people in neighboring countries across the Horn of Africa are facing extreme hunger that has been fueled by the prolonged drought that's going on. And this has caused consecutive rainy seasons to fail and still brings us to the question of water as well. And also the war in Ukraine has also continued to exacerbate this really already terrifying high levels of food insecurity. And just over a week ago, I visited one community that's Wajia County in northeastern part of Kenya. And this is a community whose 80% of livelihoods come from their livestock. But again, what I witnessed there was really deeply shocking and a deeply shocking example of how this crisis is impacting the frontline communities and also how these interconnected crises of the food, nature, and uh, climate crisis is impacting the people across the African continent. And this was about the dead and dying livestock around. They don't have water to drink, let alone the fresh water. There's no water access to them at all. And these are people that also are hungry and desperate, and they're losing hope for this future that we are talking about right now today. Mm. So the daily reality of the life of these people that I met in Wajia County is very far away from what the ideal, what the idea of the Sustainable Development Goal number six calls for. That's a clean water and sanitation for all. Their life is completely away from this future that we are talking about. And the second one is a story that I want to share about when I stumbled upon what I thought was a dump site during a program that we led with young people in Kenya. And to my surprise, we first thought we were standing on, uh, you know, on, on a dump site. But the solid ground we first thought was, uh, was the fact that these communities around this place depend on this space. And to our surprise, actually, this was supposed to be a stream. But again, it was flowing with plastic waste produced from fossil fuels. And we thought to ourselves, what would these communities be using each and every day as water? Because this is their only source of water as a stream. But again, there's no water for them at the end of the day. So my thought is, of course, the pledges from the businesses and governments to offset the loss of fresh water in natural ecosystems are to be welcomed. But again, we have been here before with pledges. You know, they're made, but they're not met. And delivery and accountability are crucial as well. And this is something that young people and civil society are fighting for in the climate space with respect to the net zero pledges. It's about committing and doing it because the climate crisis impacts are not waiting to hit in the future. They're affecting everyday lives from different people across the 
continent and across the world as well. So if the goal is to engage young people and harness energy towards an international moment for fresh water in 2023, I think the best thing that governments and companies can do is to stop talking about nature and climate change in silos and actually recognize the interconnections and start telling the new stories about what is important and also about what is possible. And right now, the life-sustaining relationship that we have between nature and humanity is not being recognized, it's not being valued, and neither it's not being protected. And what we are seeing is uh, a way in which humanity is perpetuating an ecocidal economic system that is actually destroying nature, and nature is being destroyed faster than it can even regenerate itself. So we have to stop actually destroying our own, our own life support system if we are to have that kind of future that we are talking about. And it has to start right now because we cannot wait for the next years to turn things around. We need to do it while we still have time. Thank you. Well, that is quite a well-aimed indictment at all of us, right? Pledges made and not met. So we have the opportunity now with this UN conference on water to, uh, to do better. So, Prime Minister, what, what are the, your goals for this upcoming conference and, and how, uh, how can all of these different stakeholders uh, support uh, those goals? Well, basically, Elizabeth just articulated them. Yeah. The two are, first of all, not again a conference which is not leading to any action. So it has to be action-oriented. It's the first conference in 44, 45 years on uh, taking place on water. Where is Tajikistan? Tajikistan is a glacier country. The Netherlands is laying half of the country below sea level. When you land at Schiphol Airport, it is four meters below sea level. So we like to say God created the earth, the Dutch created the Netherlands. <laughs> um, with all the dikes, etc., for all the centuries. So uh, it's from, let's say, the mountains to the sea. Uh, we together, Tajikistan and Netherlands, we cover this. And we both want this conference to be ex- uh, action-oriented as possible, and it has to be cross-sectoral. I'm so happy with the fact that you are here on this panel. Uh, you bringing the perspective from your country and what it means for people in real life, in day-to-day -day life, if we cannot solve this problem. And if we again have a conference where we have all this uh, posturing and nice talks and, and then saying, well, we should do this, and then five years later, nothing has happened. And this is integral. Uh, SDG 6 is not standing on its own. It has an impact on so many other uh, SDG uh, uh, goals, um, uh, and that, therefore it has to be cross-sectoral. You mentioned this example of small farming, small, small farming, for example. And uh, um, when you look, for example, at a thing I learned about, uh, how you can produce compost from waste, and therefore reduce the amount of water a farmer needs to use uh, to produce his crop, it, it, it is also these type of small innovations which will bring us forward. And you can only get there if you do this uh, uh, across this, the various sections of our economy. And therefore, and that would be my final comment on your question, we need the involvement of big business. I do not believe we can solve these kind of issues if it is just governments or NGOs, it is the three. It is governments, NGOs, and the business community. Mm. Because the Coke, you, uh, uh, the, the company I worked for, Unilever, and so many others, we collectively, these companies have so much knowledge, but also the logistical power to get this done uh, together with NGOs and, and governments. So uh, th that's how we want to shape this conference uh, and to make it, again, uh, as, as, as action-oriented as possible. Wonderful. So... Uh, Senior Minister Tharman, Elizabeth left us with a really powerful image of a, of a river of plastic, a dump site. You've just come back from a conference in Geneva talking about these issues. How can we inject that sort of imagery that's the combination of plastics, fossil fuels, recycling, water, water shortages, food, into this dialogue uh, more effectively, do you think? And what are the, how do we link those economics in a way that really can land and, and be understandable? So I think we have to be uh, first um, motivated by what Elizabeth said, uh, that this is basically a crisis of lives and livelihoods for such a large part of humanity. And we need to find, as Prime Minister Rutter said, practical, concrete solutions to address it. The key that links the two is governance at every level, yeah. local, regional, federal, within sovereign states, and international. 
we have to, one way or another, we're going to have to invest more. And we're not going to be able to mobilize and sustain investments at a much higher level. Essentially, if you're talking about, if you just talk about the low and middle income countries, it needs about $300 billion per year. $300 billion per year. Vastly more than what is going into all the innovations required today. Just to scale up innovations. Innovations which already exist but need scaling up by the public and private sector. And to do that, we need governance changes at every level. This is not the responsibility of a water official or water ministry. It is a whole government responsibility. Uh, in Singapore, not that I want to dwell on my own country's experience, every quarter, the entire cabinet gets a report on water. It's not the responsibility of just the ministry in charge of the environment. Mm. The entire cabinet gets a report on water, and the prime minister, starting from our first prime minister, takes deep interest in it, and there's an exchange on the report. The latest metrics, what's happening here, how, how do we solve the latest problem? It's a whole-of-government approach. We were vulnerable, like the Dutch were historically. And necessity is not just the mother of invention, but the mother of governance, of solution-oriented, whole-of-government governance. And it's not difficult to do, just having that governance mindset where everyone is involved, because it's not the Water Ministry or the Environment Ministry that's the one that's using water. It's the economic ministries, it's everyone. And we need a whole-of-government and whole-of-society approach to solving the problem, starting with valuing water which is not just a market concept, it's not a commercial concept, it's a public sector concept. It's a concept that's essential to solve this problem for humanity. We've got to value water. So these are solvable problems. We can mobilize the funding required. We can invest in an equitable fashion to scale up solutions that exist around the world with the right governance. So it, you said that the governance mindset, it's not hard. It, it looks hard, given that we aren't doing it yet. Uh, but I think we do have this opportunity. Uh, as Prime Minister Guta just said, we have the right representatives of stakeholders here on this stage. And it would be, I'd, I'd like to turn to talking about some of the suggestions that we have to help us think about some of the initiatives that should be on the table. Um, uh, Senior Minister Tharman, you had referenced something that Paul also said, which is we don't have a powerful metric yet for this. It's a whole of society problem, but not something, uh, not something simple uh, to measure yet. Uh, James, you've been ahead of this issue for two decades. Could you, what are your suggestions? What are the sort of initiatives that you, from, from your vantage point, would, su would suggest be on the agenda for the conference that we see coming in 2023? Uh, I, I think it, it, just to start with the, the senior ministers, there is an intersection of governance at its multiple levels and the natural interests of business and the natural interests of communities. And let, let me, let me, let me, throw out some examples which, which are very familiar to me. I met, spent many years working in Latin America and we had an objective of replenishing water uh, and we looked at it and actually you go, actually reforestation, because when you are in a lot of hilly areas, the water runs very quickly down the hill if there aren't trees and actually scrapes off the earth and runs very quickly out into the ocean. So it doesn't go into the aquifer, so the, 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 the aquifer is not replenished. You need to slow down the, the movement of the water, which is trees. Why aren't there any trees? Where did they all go? The local community burnt them for fuel. They're poor. They don't have natural fuel sources. So unless the government brings electricity to the area, they're going to keep chopping down the trees you put in, and then the water's going to keep running off. So we, had, we worked with a number of governments to make sure that infrastructure was coming to the villages that allowed the community to see value in keeping the trees. Actually, you generate a market dynamic whereby they are then the custodians of the forest involved in planting and keeping them. So they have a market-based economy. The government has brought in the infrastructure and electricity. The water runs off slower. There's less soil erosion. The aquifer gets away. So you need all these things to come together. There's, there's no, the government can make the framework, but unless there's a market-based 
answer. It's not going to work. The same with, with plastics. You need a circular economy. You, you don't need to just attach a philosophical public service value to it. You need a marketplace value to it. And that is what will generate circularity. And that is not just a dynamic that will play out in the water-stressed areas. Uh, the examples from Kenya, my example from Latin America, they tend to be more arid, water-stressed areas. Let's go swing our way you know, back to Europe, back to the Netherlands, which has got an abundance of water. Actually, Europe ends up with much more flooding because of climate change. So actually, there are parts of the world where we need to redo the marshes. Actually, funnily enough, right next to our Dutch plant is a marsh area. Yeah. We're interested in regenerating the marsh because the marsh, we don't want our plant to be flooded. So with the right planning frameworks, you can see the regeneration of these natural solutions. But you have to bring together the government framework the community around it has to see a market-based reason to support that solution and not do the opposite, and then businesses can come together. I think that actually generates solutions for us that are expandable uh, and, and can really make a difference to the water and the climate change. Paul, what would you add to that from the perspective of the private sector? To uh, Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I think I'll just kind of uh, build a little bit here on, on my own story here. You know, Cornfus was founded back in, in 1945, uh, by the way, by my, by my grandfather. And, you know, um, saving water, caring about climate, caring about the, the, the world as such is not new to us. But I think as, a, as a also a relatively new CEO here into the business, um, there's a couple of elements here that, that actually help frame where, where we are going. And, and, and one of them being, being, I think, the SGDs helped us um, really articulate kind of the overall uh, messages, the purpose, the direction of, of, uh, of where we are, we are going. So that helped Grundfos also in, in that journey. And then I think the, um, the SBTIs, so the science-based targets now, makes it concrete, right? And, and, and I think that is, that is great. It makes it really actionable. Now we can go do something about it. Is it easy? No, it's not. And then we would have also done it hmm. some time ago, wouldn't we? But, but I think back, back to that I mentioned earlier, we have a common language on climate. And, um, and, and I think with that and that development now with the SDGs and, and the SBTIs, this has given us the opportunity to take our own medicine and I think we have some great examples here in the room from the, from the private side, but also from, from a country level where fantastic uh, um, uh, examples are, are, are live right now that others can be inspired from. So, so you know, again, I think we, um, that, that, that way of, of, of moving forward on climate is exactly the same recipe we will need on water. Uh, and I think that is a, a, a great opportunity to, to talk about. Um, because we are, we, are, we are here and uh, here in this, in this forum, but I've also had the chance to actually talk to, to numerous uh, CEOs and other influencers in, um, down here in, in Davos. And you know, people are excited about this. Absolutely. People want to contribute. But what they're looking for is that common framework, that common language, common targets, so that we can move in the, in the same uh, direction uh, uh, together. And I think we can definitely uh, uh, do that. And uh, I think us as, uh, as, as water champions here, I think in the, in, in the next year, yeah, it's, it's coming actually quite close, so we need to move fast, faster, Mr. Prime Minister, Nine on months. it and, and, and getting, getting to the facts uh, around that. And wouldn't it be fantastic to actually build a kind of 1.5 degree goal on water? I mean, something that we can really all targeted uh, go for and that is uh, something that I believe would uh, would be fantastic and actually there's also a lot of technology that's also available to solve some of the issues uh, out there already and we will for sure like to be part of that uh, of that journey and contributing to a better world when it comes to water sure. so James and Paul to both of you just to stay on the private sector initiative what do you think is missing um, you mentioned a, a clear target that there is energy behind this and yet it's not something frankly that we read about much we hear a lot about 
companies' <laughs> ESG goals, but not water specifically. What do you think is, is, missing, is missing? How do we motivate more companies to be out front talking about this or integrating it into their ESG strategies? Um, I think the, the, the simple answer is, you, it, no pun intended, you've got to go with the flow. <laughs> and if going with the flow means you've got to attach it to climate change, then we attach it to climate change. Right. Um, and, and it is a powerful part of the solution set for climate. And, and we have our own water goals. As, I mean, we've been on a journey. It's so important to us. Mm. We have our replenishment goals and scarcity yeah. goals. Yeah. But in general terms for most businesses, uh, I think we need to attach it to climate. And, I, and, and again, it has to be a market force. The senior minister said it. If water doesn't have a price, it will never be valued. Mm. I mean, if it takes how many millions of litres to make a kilo of lithium? I mean, yeah. that's a... That's, Two billion. That's a lot of water. So, you know, we have to value these things. And, and that's one of, been one of the great barriers on water is that actually, as I said, 70% of the water is used by small-scale agricultural farmers. Um, imposing a price on them is very economically damaging. Um, but unless water has a value, it's going to be very difficult. So if we could value water in the same way we could value carbon, um, then the market will be the mechanism to drive the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just a short follow-up to that. I mean, can you make it sound a little bit uh, easy and, and like that everybody has got the ESG and a focus on water? Mm. I don't think so. Mm. So I think this is a major shout-out to the world to actually start putting this uh, on, on the agenda. I think, you know, big, small, gigantic government, whatnot, uh, companies, they can all engage in, uh, in, in this, in this uh, journey here. But let's create a common framework so everybody can move in the, in the same and the right direction here on this. So more emphasis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Elizabeth, I, you know, I, it, you spoke really powerfully about the impacts on the community. And, and James mentioned some initiatives that were working in Latin America to uh, create market initiatives. Uh, we've seen uh, you know, a great example for lithium that some companies are now doing direct extraction, which uses very little water, in part due to community pressure. Uh, what else do we need to hear from communities and, and how would you push us to, to act more directly given what you're seeing? I think I would say this is actually a human problem and it's not that we lack the technology that we need, it's not that we lack innovations, it's not that we lack everything that we need right now. It's a human problem mm -hmm. and for us to solve this human problem we're going to need human solutions. It's all about how we really take these issues into our hearts and into our minds. Because if we do not have these frontline communities at the center of every decision we are making and at the center of every action we are taking, then we're still going to be moving so many steps backwards. And I think for me, it would be great if we have our way of living in a way that we are actually not taking from the earth, but actually giving more back to the earth's ecosystems. Because our way of doing things is in a way that we take so much from the earth's ecosystems, but only give too little back to the earth. And what happens is that we are the ones who continue to bear the worst impacts of these impacts. Because the communities that I've talked about, these are communities that live in a continent that contribute to less than 4% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. But they are the ones that bear the biggest brunt of these impacts. So how can we still continue in our normal way of doing things where we still take away from nature and give less back to nature. I think also what we need to do is to think around how we can go beyond the circular economy and just actually move towards a regenerative one. Because our systems right now, like I mentioned, our economic models right now are not really putting our nature, our ecosystems as a priority. And every time we talk about nature, we talk about water, we talk about all these things, but we don't talk about how we can actually still continue to protect the already existing and intact ecosystems. Because if we continue to carry on as before, then we're not going to be solving any problem. We're only going to be making things worse for these communities. This is about lives, it's about livelihood, it's about people who are not waiting for these things to impact them tomorrow. So they need us to take immediate action. So this is about accountability. It's about delivering, because we've been here before. We've had these things before, and we continue to hear them. But unless we 
allow ourselves to actually be accountable and actually be responsible for the fact that these lives and livelihoods depend on the decisions we make today, then I think we will still be talking about the same things every now and then. But I think it's possible for us to actually turn things, th these things around, but we actually have to be moved uh, you know, by taking into account that these are human problems and they need human solutions as well. True. So human problems, human solutions. You've got uh, some initiatives yeah. on the stage. Uh, how can we encourage all of these stakeholders to, to help continue to put more drive behind these initiatives? What's missing in your view in this discussion that we should think about for next year? Well, first of all, this is a fantastic panel because we have all these various uh, societal forces here, uh, the, the business community, government, the NGOs, society. Um, my take out from this discussion and this debate is that we have to focus on a couple of issues. One, of course, is governance. Um, and governance could maybe even help to get the human focus back as soon as possible at the local level. I, I know that in my country we have these local water authorities. Um, they are helping 25 local water authorities in countries in Africa and other parts of the world, in, uh, in 15 countries, on very practical stuff. So that is practical stuff uh, focusing on, for example, um, how to adapt to climate change, a big one, but also how to improve and expand service delivery, very practical, uh, and to improve their credit uh, worthiness. And what basically they're doing is they're focusing on uh, to scale up and replicate uh, what is working for us and, and in those parts of the world they're helping, uh, but also to tell them, please discontinue or change what is not working, stop this, um, innovate what needs to be improved, and then of course there's the question of funding. That is the second theme coming out of this debate, we need the money. Mm. Now one of the things uh, we are doing and many other countries are doing is that our public climate financing towards developing countries already goes into adaptation, most of it. Uh, more than half uh, or about half of our uh, funding in that area goes to uh, adaptation. This is something we as governments can work on to ask others uh, to do more of. But this brings me to um, an, a third issue, which has to do with the sort of framework. And you, Tarman, you are chairing, co-chairing, um, uh, I believe, and it's very important, this Global Commission on the Economics of Water. And uh, I believe that will also be a mobilizing force to get all the information on the table, including, uh, and this was an old initiative years ago, the Valuing Water Initiative, uh, but we have to feed this into, I think, also, if, th if that was the idea, I thought it was the idea to do, into this commission to make sure that we have that, that, that data on the table. And then if we can bring that together uh, and indeed have businesses and, and governments and NGOs sitting there in March next year, but in the run-up to that moment, bring to the table all these practical initiatives and, and show us what can be done. And at the end of the day, the test is whether in your villages you are mentioning, the, the two examples in your first intervention this morning, whether it is an answer to that, uh, this stream of plastics, uh, the access to water, um, because that at the end of the day is, is the test. Um, of course, there are many other issues. I mean, you mentioned that in the Netherlands we have uh, too much water, but these days we have not enough. <laughs> there is a drought issue now. It was there in 2020. It is again, we have a huge drought issue in the Netherlands this year. We have never experienced this. Yeah. Uh, so we have too much or not enough, uh, almost never there is just enough. Uh, okay, but we are a rich country, we, yes. can, we can deal with this. Um, but uh, still, uh, this means that every part of the world has its own challenges and problems. Uh, but of course, the, 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 the ultimate test is whether it helps us in the, in the fight against climate change and it helps us in improving lives in these local communities. That's, that's the crucial question. Uh, and I agree with Elizabeth, it is about the human focus. There's always the risk that we have these high-level debates and we produce reports, etc. But at the end, uh, one drop of water lands somewhere in Kenya. No, it has to be a stream of water landing in Kenya. So Elizabeth, you've got a global audience here, on, uh, not just on the stage and in the audience, but through live stream. Uh, we're not living up to the commitments we've made. And, and you're seeing that on a day-to-day -day basis. What would you want to push all of us to do uh, in addition or maybe doubling down on some of the ideas you've already heard presented on the stage? I think one of the main things that I would push everyone to do is actually do more and remind ourselves that we are still not doing what science tells us that we must do. 
to get to where we need to get and to meet our targets. And again, we are not going to also meet our climate targets without nature as well. So we have to make sure that all these issues are not being solved in silos. These issues are all connected. And so we cannot have issues whose drivers are similar, but our solutions are everywhere. So we have to solve these issues together. We have to make sure that we're actually not solving them in silos. And most importantly, we have to move with urgency because this is about people whose lives and livelihoods are affected by every delay in action. So we cannot still continue to delay action if we really care about the people who are on the front line. And most importantly, we have to keep reminding ourselves about these stories of people whose lives depend on the decisions that we are making every day. And I think what is most important is that we actually be selfless because everything that we do today is about every person who is impacted in another part of the world. And just because these impacts are not happening where you are, it doesn't mean that they are not happening at all. There are people who actually have stories to tell about how they're being impacted. And so we cannot close our hearts and our minds into these issues. They have to be at the center of every decision that we are making. But most importantly, we have to deliver our pledges and our commitments because we cannot continue to be at the same place every now and then. And it's important that we do this for these communities. It is important that we do this for humanity. And again, when it comes to nature, this is our life support system. And if we're destroying our own life support system, then we're not doing justice to ourselves and we're not doing justice to the next generation that is going to inherit this planet. So it would be great if we actually leave this place better than we found it. We have to keep reminding ourselves this each and every day because it's about generations to come. It's about people whose lives right now depend on it. And we will not have this freshwater future if the world today is not, is not livable. So we have to start today and right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, one practical solution is you need to bring Elizabeth with you whenever you're talking about this Absolutely. issue over the next year. <laughs> this is... Very powerful, yes. uh, and and it is really very inspiration. Also inspires me to do even more. And and you are so right. It is through the silos, across sectors. Can I add to that? Uh, it also has to do with how can we scale and replicate. So when we have examples of what is working, how can we make sure that they are scalable in other parts of Africa, uh, Asia, or Europe, or whatever? And also how to replicate them. And if it is not possible, and it is just working at one village in Kenya. It's also fine <laughs> because you want to deal with the issues there. But if we can scale them and replicate them, that is also helpful. And somehow package them in a way that others can quite easily access that information and do the same. Uh, and, and therefore, again, it is, as, as I think comes out of this discussion, it is about governance, it is about money, but it's also about this framework. By the way, the WEF uh, plays an important role here. Uh, the fact that we sit here together, uh, but also that in the coming month, uh, the WEF will try to bring together these various tracks, uh, which are sometimes working a bit siloed at the moment, uh, separate from each other, but to bring them together will be uh, very important. So in that sense, it's also the WEF 2.0 uh, being also very active in between the meetings. I don't know about you, Prime Minister, but I was listening with admiration uh, when the senior minister was talking about how in government, yes. the reports uh, that, uh, that cut across that every ministry has been given accountability, which is what our colleagues uh, were talking about in the private sector, the measurements, the accountability. How did that initiative get started? What advice would you have for the, the people listening from the government sector as to how they can replicate that level of accountability? Well, I suppose, you know, countries like Singapore and the, the Netherlands uh, started this early because we were vulnerable. We were water vulnerable. Uh, the world is now water vulnerable. And it means starting with, it's not just about what each ministry or department does or what each segment of society does. We've got to accept that water, mm. like carbon, has to, be, has to be priced. And that's not about efficiency at the end of the day. It's about equity and sustainability. Uh, Elizabeth talked about selflessness. We need both that selflessness and the realization that it's in our self-interest to be selfless. Because what the, the drought in the Netherlands that Prime Minister Rutte spoke about wasn't because of some misdoings by the local community in that area. No. 
we are all affected by what happens in every part of the world. That's why the climate crisis and the water crisis are about the global commons. What each of us do contributes to the problem somewhere else in the world. We, we spoke about the fact that irrigation practices, uh, they need to be completely redone so as to use less water and to has, have less pollution in the runoff, right? But think about what all of us as consumers do. A large part of the water consumed in North America, let's say, an advanced group of societies, goes towards producing grain for cattle, for livestock. Mm -hmm. A very large part. So the same questions we ask ourselves on climate, how much beef should we be consuming, are the same questions that we have to ask for water. And there is an intersection of solutions that addresses both climate and water rather than pitches climate against water that we've got to focus on. You spoke about lithium. You can say the same about copper, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, very water intensive uh, uh, products. Yes. And if we think of climate by itself, we can solve the problem with the right will, with the right resources, with the right pricing. But we might be creating a even larger problem on water. So we've got to think of them together yeah. and find solutions that basically solve both of them together. But being selfless and being self-interested is the same thing when it comes to the global commons. Mm -hmm. What goes around comes around. Can I, can I just emphasize one thing, what Singapore is doing extremely well, which is rigor. And rigor doesn't cost money. It doesn't cost one dollar to have the Prime Minister ask every member of the Cabinet, have you read the report? And what do we learn from this? And we are not doing this in the Netherlands to that extent. So I'm learning from, what you, from this example. I think we should do that better. Because also we all have these reports, but we are not discussing them at that level of detail. This doesn't cost you one cent. It's just a question of focus, uh, of rigor, and that's something we can learn from, uh, from Singapore. And, and I just wanted to mention later today, there is the uh, Champions of Water community also coming together here at the WEF. Lisa Schreinemacher, our Minister for Foreign Aid and Foreign Trade, will be there uh, also to collect initiatives. So I think uh, this is not uh, the final say today, <laughs> but uh, just the start of a whole day of uh, water mm -hmm. debates. So the challenge is pricing in this externality. It's the selflessness and the self-interest. And, and both of you touched on the market, market initiatives, a, a measure. How do we start to attack the problem of pricing water appropriately for its usage? Any ideas? Well, I, that's clearly in the governance uh, bucket, uh, I think, going forward. And I think the, the challenge is not pricing water, because actually, in most places, there is a price for water if you're an industrial user. Um, the, the question is, how can we give it value for the vast number of users, recognizing that most of them are on a few dollars a day income. Yeah. Um, and so charging them for water is going to be, you know, catastrophic. Um, but then we need to find a mechanism that encourages them and, and, uh, and provides them new methods of irrigation, first and foremost, that allows them to use a lot less water. And then if they don't, there's some price to not to using more water. So it, it is a micro level uh, um, uh, uh, problem and maybe there are mechanisms uh, in that microfinance sector uh, where you can give credits for to use a certain amount of water, give credits to uh, have investments in, in you know, simple things, drip irrigation, um, and, and yet if they use more water uh, then they don't get a credit for it, so then they have to start paying for it. So I, there might be solutions uh, in there, um, but it's, it's not sexy like going to Mars, it's actually very um, straightforward stuff, millions, if not billions of times. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul, the, the, the tricky cold call question, how do we do this? Any other, uh, anything to add? Well, I, <clears throat> I, I think it will be, be important, but, and, and putting a pricing on, on water, but, but um, I think in different parts of the world, mm -hmm. you are in different situations right. and just kind of, adding one model, one business model into that, I, I think is, is, is very difficult. But a focused uh, pricing on water or a tax or whatever it is, if you don't live up to it, like we have a, a green tax uh, now established in Denmark also, you know, slowly getting some of these mechanisms mm -hmm. there in place, I think is, is important. But I think you, you got to add it or scale it depending on the situation and the maturity that you are in as a, as a country. 
Right. But overall, I think that's also a, a great point to add into the, to the overall uh, UN conference uh, coming up. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, Prime Minister, I mean, you said yourself that Netherlands is dealing with droughts and yeah. floods. Would you imagine and, my country but, dealing right. with droughts? But you Second can afford time it. In two right. years. Right. Yeah, but you can afford it. Yes, right, you can afford yes. to solve it. And so how exactly. Do, right. And that's different from Kenya and so many yes. other countries. So, yeah. And mm -hmm. that, that's why we need to work on the, to get this done. And uh, I very much like what James was saying about the very practical aspects of valuing water. I'm not an expert on this, but it is clearly a separate work stream we have to work on. And much of, a lot of work has been done already. And I hope the Commission could also take this, uh, take this further, also in a run-up to the UN uh, UN uh, Water Conference, but uh, it will help us to to make a, to create that conference into an event which is as practical as possible mm -hmm. and actionable as possible, and also in a run-up that we don't wait for New York uh, 2023, but in the run-up things start to happen and and start to be replicated and scaled. That's what we need to achieve, um, and and that's what we are doing at the moment with so many yeah. uh, with so many organizations. So it, it's not just starting now. But this is an event to at least uh, give extra impetus to, uh, to, the, uh, to the event. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth, to make this credible, what would you want to see on the ground as you, as you look out your window with the communities you work with? What would tell you that we were uh, moving beyond empty pledges and into real action? From what I'm hearing, we're definitely in the same storm. That's the climate crisis, the water crisis, nature crisis. But we are not in the same boats. And by not being in the same boat, there are people that definitely have the least capacity to adapt to this crisis and the least amount of resources to deal with the crisis as well. And some of these impacts right now are actually beyond human adaptation because there are certain things that humanity can actually not adapt to. And that also calls for the urgency. And I think for me, this kind of a freshwater future is going to be determined by the things that begin to change today. But the fact that women will not have to walk for long distances and miles to look for water and food for their families, the fact that they will not have to dig hand-dug wells that are not even safe for consumption to give uh, water to their children, and the fact that you know children will have food and water, people will be able to live in a community where they don't have to actually have conflicts over resources because we will teach ourselves how to actually give back more to the earth's ecosystems than we take. And this is going to be a kind of a future where we do not have the rising inequalities, a future where the climate change impacts don't have to actually be impacting people who have even least contributed. And this is only going to be made possible if we deliver and allow ourselves to also be held accountable, because then this is about the actions we are taking today, the decisions we are taking today, and how we are actually choosing to respond to this crisis. And all these things are going to be realized. It's possible, and this is the kind of future I envision. This is the kind of world I want to see. But this world is not going to be possible for me. It's not going to be possible for every child out there if we don't begin to do things right now. Because we cannot promise a future and you know, assume that people will get that to that future if the world today has certain things that make it uh, not livable. So we have to begin turning things around right now to give that kind of future to me, to the children, and the next generations that are to come. Thank you. So, yes, I was... So inspired by, yes. by what uh, yeah. Elizabeth here is, is talking about, maybe just a concrete example that mm -hmm. is also scalable. You know, so, so last year we... Uh, we contributed with, one point, uh, with, with fresh or, or clean drinking water for 1.6 uh, million people, uh, many of them in, uh, in Africa. And we, next year, it's going to be 2 million. That would make me really proud. Uh, and then in, in, in 2030, 300 million people that do not have access today will get uh, access to, to clean drinking water. This, this, is, this is by sustainable solar pumping solutions. And it's not just about the product. It's actually about the business model. It's about the local education of people on the ground so they can actually maintain, understand, but also learn about the precious value that water actually is on the ground. And then they can actually start this from a, from a, um, in a, into a sustainable future for, for society. How does that work? Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Absolutely. We, we can take into the, into the technical details, but, it, but in general... No, no not technical, pump, but, 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 but practical. How, how in, in a, a pump is actually yeah. a groundwater pump into the ground... It, it is run by solar cell. The water comes up yeah. and it's actually cleaned 
uh, by by a cleaning unit, and it makes it. So this is standalone. Standalone local unit. Installation. Standalone unit, and there's actually a little kiosk system where people can actually yeah. go and yeah. and uh, get acquainted and actually pay for water, buy water, but it's kept locally in the community. It's a fantastic uh, little system. We have actually worked with with uh, Coca-Cola on that uh, in in a couple of places as well. So we are, and anybody can can join in on uh, on on that uh, great approach. We would well, love to welcome people. Right, and, and how do they do that? We're working with local NGOs. Local NGOs are helping us on the ground. Yeah. So, Paul, how do they join in? They, uh, where's the, please, what's the please contact? Please, uh, yeah. please contact uh, me, contact yes. uh, Grundfos. Uh, Wonderful. Absolutely. We'd love to join in. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so, so you hear those initi initiatives, and, and I had heard about it, but not as, uh, as eloquently as you just here put it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it might be solvable. Is it affordable? And it's also affordable. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's good solutions, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Right. So other practical solutions, I mean, Paul, this is really inspiring at the end of a rather depressing uh, discussion of the current <laughs> situation. Um, other things that you've seen in your global travels, Paul, James, uh, senior minister that, that we'd want to bring in here, or Elizabeth, that you've seen some positive signs on the ground? No, I mean, the good, the good yeah. thing, by the way, uh, is that far more so than in addressing the climate crisis, where you know some of the technologies required, carbon capture, uh, green hydrogen, and so on, are still being developed. Right. In water, the technologies exist, yeah. mm -hmm. by and large. They have to be made affordable, and you make it affordable by adapting the technologies so they're suitable for every village in every country, but you also made it, make, make it affordable through scale. And we need to scale this up. Yeah. It requires some finance, but the finance will come if, in fact, the technologies are working to deliver value. And value is not just the commercial value, it's how it's changing people's lives. I mean, what Elizabeth said about women having to look for water, 40% yeah. of the time of women in rural Africa is spent daily, 40% of the day, is spent looking for firewood and water. So it's a life tra transformer. Mm -hmm. And if they save that 40% of the time, Imagine what else they'll be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can add one other example, which is a totally different issue around water, which is if when you have too much, yeah. and, you, and of course in the, in the past you will build dikes and, and the, they are ugly, they are concrete. Uh, what we have developed with countries like Bangladesh, Indonesia and others is yep. the concept of building with nature. That you have some small interventions, for example, building a small island or some small uh, other sort of um, um, artificially created um, uh, yeah, island or whatever, which is then um, rerouting the flow of water. And by doing that is uh, bringing down the risks of flooding mm -hmm. in a way that you are not impacting on the environment because these dikes uh, can have a huge impact mm -hmm. uh, on the environment and also on uh, ecological systems. So also here, the technology is there. And it is sometimes even cheaper to do it in that way than to build these uh, concrete dikes. And you have all these houses disappearing behind the dikes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one of the most unique things about the frontline communities is the fact that most of these communities have also chosen not to actually be victims. And they're also working on solutions on the ground to try and deal with some of these impacts. And we can see a lot of resilience with uh, how they're trying to do certain things. And what excites me the most is the fact that some of these solutions are actually greatly inspired by the late Professor Angari Mathai, who has also greatly inspired the work that I do each and every day. And for her, she started by working with women because she discovered that by working with women and by helping women plant trees around their communities and their farms, they would be able to get food, to get water, and to also get firewood to sustain their everyday lives. And I've also seen so many youth groups trying to even clean up streams around them by planting bamboo trees along the riparian. And this is because for some of these places, the pollution levels of these rivers is actually making it uninhabitable for people that live around there because this is the water they want to drink. But then it's flowing with plastic waste. It's also very unsafe to drink. It's not safe for consumption. So they cannot still continue to watch as the streams flow with this waste. So they step up and choose 
to do it by themselves, even though they are not the cause of it all. So seeing these initiatives coming up with uh, youth groups and women especially should sound a message to us that the frontline communities are not just sitting back and choosing to be victims, they're stepping up. And what we can do is to actually also make sure that our investment choices go into these frontline communities. Mm. Because most of these solutions are struggling to scale up. They do not have the much needed resources as well and the much needed capacity to scale up and make them much more impactful. So we cannot be talking about reinventing new solutions when there are already solutions that people work on every other day. How can we actually scale them up and how can we make sure that they are replicated elsewhere each and every day? Because these are the people, these are the stories that we need to be talking about. These are the people that we need to actually be bringing on the front line and also they are the ones that are trying to turn things around because they have seen that these impacts are only going to make things worse. And instead of waiting for people that have much bigger capacity and much more resources, they've chosen to step up as well. And also one of the things that has, uh, that continue to make me really talk about the, what the future looks like is working with children because this is a generation that is going to be greatly impacted by the consequences of climate change. And if anything, it's the young people and children of today that are going to have to live longer with the consequences of the world's inaction and the consequences of every decision that is made today. So by working with these children, and I'll just give a practical example of a time that I worked with children to a stream nearby their school that was again polluted and flowing with plastic waste. And this was to view the world in a perspective of a five-year-old, a 10-year-old. And they asked me two questions when we got into this stream. And one question was, who did this? And the second one is, what can we do about it? Yeah. So it tells you that these people are not choosing to be victims. No. They are determined to clean their own air, to clean their own water, to grow their own food within their school compounds by even growing fruit trees around their schools. But again, we have to get behind this generation. It's about every sector. It's about also seeing how much more can we do. These people, can, that's the best that they can do. But I would assume for governments and a big company, they can do much more than these communities can do. So if we all get back together and do the best that we can do, and I know the best that I can do is not the best that maybe you can do. So it's about like making sure that we are actually stepping up and working together and uh, you know, and complementing each other's work as well. Mm -hmm. Because while these people are trying to do certain things within their school compound, I always like to give example with the children that I work mm -hmm. with. While they are planting trees within their school compound and trying to green their own school, out of their school gates, they see big businesses and corporations fueling deforestation. And that is undermining their efforts in their school. So it's about how we complement each other's efforts and make sure that every sector is actually doing the best that they can to turn things around, because it's possible. Thank you, Elizabeth. Right. I, we can't end on a better note than that. I just want to thank our guests. We have the technology. We have the, the people to implement. Paul Dwight Jen Jensen, uh, James Quincy, Senior Minister Tharman, uh, Prime Minister Hutta, Elizabeth Watuti, chair. thank you, <laughs> and Chair of the UN Applause Conference, Karen Harris from Bain & Company, thank you so much for joining us this morning.